Now, the first thing I very quickly want to do here is say yes. I'm going to try and get back into the habit of doing a Let's Talk Some Star Wars video every weekend. And if you're new around here and don't know what that is, or just randomly clicked on this video and it's the first of mine you've ever seen, what I mainly do here is delve into the comments section of the previous week's video and either answer questions or comment on comments and just try and highlight some of the things you all had to say. And oftentimes I'll even do a specific video that I call a discussion starter video, where the point of the video is, as the name kind of implies, to get people talking about a topic so I can further go into it in this video. And this week I did indeed do that when I asked the question if the old expanded universe, now called Legends, should be in a sense brought back into the official Star Wars canon. Or should I say brought into the official canon for the first time ever since... Like it or not, George Lucas himself never recognized the old EU as official canon. Anyway, my idea for doing this was to use the world between worlds, which is another realm that the show Rebels introduced us to, and it kind of seems to make time travel possible to some extent at least. To make it so that something happened at some point in the past that changed the timeline and turned the old EU into the current timeline Disney is giving us. Furthermore, my idea was to have Snoke somehow be the one responsible for this change. And the first comment we're going to get into then was the top rated comment from that video and it came to us from Reimagining Star Wars who said, I like the idea of two timelines. I would like to see an animated series that follows the old EU. This would let old fans get their Star Wars back. And as cool as an idea as that truly is, and as much as it would be appreciated by some fans, myself included, it's probably one they're never going to go for. Unless, of course, we're talking about some aspect of the Old Republic making its way into an animated show or live-action TV series, which I really do think is only a matter of time. Because as cool as a movie or trilogy surrounding the Old Republic would be, I think the time period lends itself much better to a long-running TV show. Something akin to Game of Thrones could appease both longtime fans of the Old Republic and bring new fans quickly into the fold. Anyway, as this poll suggests, and yes I admit 2,000 people is not a giant sample size, and that since I'm not prone to talk about the EU on this channel, I probably don't have a ton of hardcore followers of the EU watching me. Anyway, this poll begins to suggest that most fans only ever had a passing interest in the old EU, and as Jedi Bunny's comment here further begins to suggest, I think a lot of fans only like to know what happened in the old EU by either reading the source books or watching YouTube videos or getting that info some other way that didn't involve actually sitting down and reading everything it had to offer. And forgive me Jedi Bunny, I don't mean to imply you yourself aren't an avid reader, because you may very well be, but I do think a lot of people just like hearing about what happened in the old EU without the investment of sitting down and actually reading a book for hours. You also have an intimidation factor for new fans who might want to get into it, but considering the sheer volume of material that now exists, it's hard to know just where to start. So basically what I'm saying here is that I have little doubt that the EU had a large fan following, but it was still rather small when compared to the greater whole of the fandom. Our next comment then comes to us from Ben Walsh who says, The EU never died. The concept of canon was never one I looked fondly on even before Disney made their stance, so canon means nothing to me. Disney claimed they would do their own thing, yet all I've seen from them for the most part, is EU ripoffs or half-hearted attempts to diverge from it. The EU remains alive and well as it always has regardless of what Disney does. I don't want a resurrection that's unneeded, I want to see innovative storytelling from Disney. And this is very, very well said on Ben's part. If the EU is canon to you, then it's canon. We can all, on an individual level, choose what we want to follow and how we want to enjoy Star Wars. Just because Disney waved a hand and wiped it all away, doesn't mean they removed it from our hearts and minds. As I said earlier in this video, even Lucas himself regarded it not as part of his Star Wars, and that never stopped people from enjoying it in the first place. I guess the reason or thinking behind my initial video was a way to explain, within the story itself, what had happened to the EU. I thought it might be a way for Disney to recognize that yes, that all really did happen in the Star Wars universe, but something else happened to change it all. However, there were plenty who didn't seem to like this idea at all, including 1701 Earl Grey, who had this to say. So this is Star Trek 2009 all over again. And there were also many others who compared my idea to the reboot of the Star Trek franchise, and yeah, I'll admit, there are some similarities there. 
However, I really wasn't trying to imply that there are infinite timelines in Star Wars, which has been established to be the case in Star Trek, but rather there is one timeline and that somehow Snoke made his way into the world between worlds and did something that changed everything. And as I said in the initial video, and many agreed with me on this, the world between worlds should be used very, very sparingly. In fact, as someone suggested, and I for the life of me can't find your comment so forgive me, whatever Snoke did to change things should also destroy the world between worlds, or at least close it off from ever being accessed again. Because as cool as the idea of time travel is in theory, it's rarely executed well in stories. Not only that, but once the ability to change the past is put in place, it gives everything far less meaning when you know it can all be changed. Lastly here on this topic, I'll leave you with another question. Should Disney allow the EU to continue under the Legends label? Yeah, I know they still publish the books and all, but should they allow authors to continue to create new stories or should it just be left as is? Now, I think the main argument against this here is that you don't want to confuse people about what is and isn't canon, but isn't that what the Legends label is already for, to keep things straight? So if there's a market for it, and there seems to be, then I don't see the harm in letting those stories continue. My only stipulation or hope would be that it wouldn't interfere with the release schedule of the new canon material, which some I have very much enjoyed. Okay, moving on to my next video of the week, where I talked about what George Lucas may or may not have had planned for his version of the sequel trilogy, which, if I'm anywhere near right with my speculation, would have turned the wills into parasites that fed off the force and essentially the enemy of the new trilogy, which I know sounds crazy so I'll include a link to the video in the description below if you haven't seen it. Anyway, the top comment from that video came to us from Mike Greaves who simply said, I trust George as a storyteller. And here I'll basically just reiterate what I initially replied to him and go a little more into detail about what I meant. And that is that yes, in George's head are some incredible stories. It's the telling part that gets him a bit, and what I mean by that is the reason that the original trilogy was so fantastic and beloved and so successful was not just because of George Lucas. Yes, without him, obviously, I'm not here talking about Star Wars today with all of you. But, and especially with the first movie, now called A New Hope and once just called Star Wars, George Lucas was just George Lucas, meaning he wasn't regarded as an almost mythical figure like he is today and like how he was during the creation of the prequels. Rather, after the surprise success of American Graffiti in 1973, he was just another up-and-coming director trying to make a name for himself. And thankfully Fox took a chance on him and allowed him to make some crazy science fiction movie called Star Wars. And keep in mind sci-fi had a very niche following in the 70s, and that's putting it nicely. The point I'm trying to make here is that the original trilogy wasn't just fantastic because Lucas had this amazing idea for a movie and then a trilogy, but also because he was surrounded by other extremely talented people who he either had to listen to or he wisely chose to listen to of his own accord. And those others around him had a huge impact on just how great those movies were. Because as amazing as The Empire Strikes Back is, for example, it's not regarded as one of the greatest movies in history and arguably the best Star Wars movie without Lawrence Kasdan's writing and Irvin Kirshner's directing. The prequels, however, suffered not because Lucas didn't have a fantastic idea for them, but because there really wasn't anyone around George to take them to the next level. After all, who in the world was going to tell George Lucas no at this point in time? Who in the world was going to say, hey George, I think I have a better idea about Star Wars than you? And if you've ever watched the behind the scenes footage from the prequels, you can clearly see the answer is nobody. Lucas, whether by design or not, was surrounded by Yes Men, and the result was the prequels, which I still very much enjoy, but even the staunchest prequel defender has to admit they could have been better. The next comment I'd like to get to from this video comes to us from Alex Merlos II who said, It makes sense when you stand back and look at what episode 1 was setting up. I'm sure Lucas didn't create many chlorians just to have them mentioned in a single movie. Also I agree that had the prequels not been received so negatively, that Lucas just may have finished his version of the story. And I absolutely agree with what Alex is saying here. One of the reasons why I did enjoy the prequels is you can see that Lucas very much had his story, the Force, and so on figured out by this point. Meaning he had a clear vision for what his story was going to be in the prequels, and I even believe where it was going to go after Return of the Jedi. 
And like them or not, the midi-chlorians were meant to be a big part of the future of Star Wars, which had to be disconcerting for Lucas when the second most hated thing in The Phantom Menace, next to Jar Jar, was probably the introduction of the midi-chlorians. And even though his idea for the sequel trilogy does seem a bit out there, I'd still love to one day hear what it was in great detail, to know how the creator saw his vision coming to an end. The last comment then from this video comes to us from Violator, who said, Why do we need to understand the Force? Every time you do something like this, it destroys some of the mystery of the Force and what makes it so interesting. Sometimes it's best to let magic remain unknowable. And though I mostly agree here, there is a bit of a double-edged sword at work. Because every so often you have to reveal some mysteries. You have to find ways to expand the story, to explore and explain the Force without destroying the whole mystery around it, or eventually people are going to get tired of the same thing over and over again. It reminds me of the show The Walking Dead, which I used to watch but stopped because I got tired of the same premise repeated over and over without an expansion of the greater story. And as I said in the initial video concerning this topic, George likely saw the sequel trilogy as the end of Star Wars, and if that's the case, he probably would have felt almost obligated to explain away some of the mystery so that we the audience could understand the conclusion of the story. If we understand the nature of the Force to a fair degree, we could then understand what it being in balance means to the story, how important it is. And I'd imagine a final balance of some sort is how the sequel trilogy would have ended. And if we can understand it all, then we would have a satisfying conclusion to the story that, in theory, wouldn't leave us wanting more, though it likely still would. Okay, moving on now to yesterday's video about the news from Collider that came out a few days ago that Lucasfilm had cancelled plans for future anthology movies, including both a Kenobi and an Obi-Wan movie, and how ABC News then came out and said Lucasfilm had told them those reports were dead wrong. Well, the top comment from that video came to us from dflowers30 who said, I can care less about a Boba Fett movie, and even though I do want a Kenobi movie, what I want above all else is for Lucasfilm to get better. Stop pumping out film after film like Marvel and actually take the time with these movies. Quality over quantity. And this sentiment about Boba Fett was one shared by almost half the people who responded to the poll asking which, if any, of these two movies you'd like to see get made. And this doesn't surprise me too much because I think Boba Fett is one of those characters, much like Han, that people were okay with being more of a mystery. Yes, we did get an origin story for Boba in the prequels, and we saw him a bit in the Clone Wars animated series, but I think that's enough for a lot of fans. While Kenobi, on the other hand, well, I think a lot of people, myself included, just want to see Ewan McGregor reprise this role. Because as much as I enjoy Alec Guinness's portrayal of the character, I certainly feel Ewan is just as much Obi-Wan Kenobi as he is. And that's by no means meant as disrespect towards Guinness, as much as it is respect towards McGregor and what he brought to the character. And this goes along with what Blake Bellamy had to say. It wouldn't make sense for them to postpone or stop production of an Obi-Wan movie. Because a solo movie nobody asked for played by an actor other than Ford doesn't do well, they cancel an Obi-Wan movie starring Ewan McGregor that everybody asked for. That makes absolutely no sense. Which is so true, because even though a Solo and a Kenobi movie may look similar on the surface, the two huge differences here are McGregor and the fact that most fans seem to want this, as indicated by the fact that only 14% of people who responded to the poll said they didn't want to see either movie or just didn't want to see a Kenobi movie. And of those 14%, something tells me many of them would still very much see the movie if it does come to pass. However, perhaps the best idea, especially when you look at this poll and see that only about half those who responded wanted a FET movie at all, was presented by Mahadra in the comments on that poll when he suggested combining the two movies into one, which means you could leave Kenobi on Tatooine and just have FET looking for him. And as he pointed out, I'm sure FET would love the chance to capture a famous Jedi from the Clone Wars. And lastly for this video, and for all this week's videos, I'm just going to read this comment from Inspector Who Reacts. I personally do hope these anthology movies keep being made. These movies that do kind of have to follow rules so that they don't bust canon while still having freedom to be new and their own story. Opening up the galaxy of Star Wars to us. Most thought 7 and 8 were going to be beyond amazing while Rogue One and Solo were going to be pointless, yet I personally feel the latter films are better than the sequel trilogy simply because they're better told movies. 
Now that I think about it, you can't really watch The Last Jedi without watching The Force Awakens. Like, there are two parts of one movie, but Empire, Clones, Sith, and Jedi each are kind of okay on their own without the other movies. I'm sure after 9, anthology stories will be the norm for a while, and I really hope the fans don't stop that from happening. Finally here, I want to give a quick update for those asking about my story videos and when Tuesday will again be Fan Fiction Tuesday. Well, right now I'm still working on putting my version of Episode 8, also called The Lost Jedi, into one video. And although that sounds easy, I'm actually going back and doing just a bit of editing as well as trying to add some new art for it. And I know I've asked this before, and I've even talked to several of you in the comments about doing this, but I am still interested in working with anyone who wants to do art for the story. So I'm either going to set up an email address just for that, or direct you to Rigamondi, who is the head of the art department here at Thor Skywalker Studios. And speaking of my story videos, Lightning Star did a very, very cool review on all my stories that I'd like to thank him for and invite you all to check out. The link to it will be in the description below. And while I'm thanking people, I again want to thank everyone who watches and comments on my videos, because you make videos like this possible and give me the opportunity to express the views and opinions of others, and I think that's extremely important right now considering how divided we are as a fan base. So please feel free to give me feedback on this format and let me know if I should try to read even more comments and do less of my own rambling in between, or if you like how I'm doing things now. Lastly, thank you to all my patrons. I appreciate it so much that you help afford me the opportunity to do this even more than I could. And if you'd like to join them in supporting me, I'll include a link to my Patreon page in the description below. And even $1 a month gets you access to my Discord server, where we're always talking some Star Wars. Well, that's all I've got for you this time. Now it's your turn to once again tell me what you think about everything I had to say in this video, or to offer up suggestions for future Let's Talk Some Star Wars topics. So leave a comment below, and let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.